Jesus Christ be praised. My name is Father Kaz. I am uh, a provincial for the Marian community here in the United States in Argentina. And um, I would like to welcome each one of you here at our welcome center called St. Faustina Welcome Center. This afternoon we will have just extraordinary person to witness to the message of Fatima. So we have with us Sister Angela de Fatima Coelho da Rocha Pereira da Silva, that's the full name. Um, Sister Angela is a medical doctor, a graduate in medicine from the University of Porto in 1995, and a teacher in his faculty of medicine. In 1995, she joined the religious congregation of Alianza de Santa Maria, Alliance of Our Lady. In 2008, she graduated in religious sciences from the Pontifical University of Camillas in Madrid. Sister Angela was the postulator for the cause of canonization of Saints Francisco and Jacinta Marto, who were canonized on May 13, 2017, which is a year ago. And uh, it was done at a Fatima Shrine by Pope Francis. Now, she is now the postulator for the cause of beatification of Sister Lucia de Jesus dos Santos. We're truly privileged here to have you, Sister, with us. I have had the joy of hearing several of your talks, which was um, last weekend in Washington, D.C., last Sunday at St. John, National Shrine of St. John Paul II, as well as yesterday and the day before yesterday at the Healthcare Conference, Healthcare Professionals for Divine Mercy Conference. And each one of those talks was unique. Um, which means there's such a versatility and you don't repeat yourself. Obviously, you're not, you're not reading and you're speaking from the heart. Uh, the exciting theme today is that message of Fatima is for us today. The Blessed Mother's mission is the mission of salvation. The Lord wants everyone to be saved. And so he's inviting us to listen to the voice through his mother, to his voice, the voice of his of son. Uh, everyone is in need of salvation. Everyone is in need of, of being sanctified by grace because that is our call and we're invited to share, to participate in the unfolding of the mission of salvation, sanctifications of all. So I'd wish to welcome you and I wish to invite you to our podium to be our speaker, to be a wonderful speaker. Sister, welcome to our place. So good morning to all of you. It is my privilege to be here today and uh, to share with you this great, um, this great testimony of the life of Francisco and Jacinta. But above all, I want to thank Father Casimir for inviting me. And um, I'm so happy you know all my name. <laughs> it's, at least that you know how to read it because he's saying my name. Okay, he present me. I think this is the fifth time he's introducing me. Every single time my name was different. <laughs> so. <laughs> And yesterday, I had the courage to tell him, Father, I am not Salo, I am Coelho. <laughs> so I think you were rehearsing all your night, right, Father? <laughs> That's why we were late. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm serious, okay, now let's go. <laughs> so really, it's really, really an honor, and I have to thank also Marie Romagnano, who is welcoming me in her home making me feel at home because Father Kaz did not say this, but as you know, tomorrow is May 13, right? Yeah, May 13, and this is the first time in 23 years I'm not in Fatima. I'm in Divine Mercy in Stockbridge. <laughs> this is so good too, right? No, it's really an honor for me, and when we were deciding in our community, because we decide together all the trips you know, we should take, and uh, this was, 
with, a, with no doubt um, our certainty to be here because, you know, now that the canonization is over, now that we are already 100 years, now we have Fatimis anywhere, right? When there is love towards Jesus and towards the Blessed Mother, here is Fatima. So in Stockbridge, there is a little bit of this feeling like home that I'm very happy and blessed to be here, Father. I want to thank each one of you to come here today to share with me. Um, and of course, as you notice, I am not from the United States. I'm Portuguese. That means my English is first with a Portuguese accent, second with some Portuguese words with an English accent. <laughs> so, but I'll try to make myself clear. So, the, the, the project here is I'll try to speak more or less 15 minutes. Um, then I am open to questions, okay? If you want to take any question about this. Today I will speak about Francisco and Jacinta. Tomorrow I will speak about the, the divine mercy in the message of Fatima or the dimension of the mercy in the message of Fatima, which is already present, but um, let's do it. Are you ready? Yes. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> it is, um, many times I used to say there are like two main doors to get into the message of Fatima, okay? And first thing I want you to be clear, or let us be clear about this from the beginning is, when I am talking about Fatima, I am talking about the 13 year period of apparitions. 1916 with the apparition of the Angel of Portugal, the Angel of Peace, which I will speak a little bit tomorrow. 1916 to Francisco, Jacinta and Lucia, the three shepherd children, Francisco and Jacinta, brothers and sister, Lucia was the cousin. 1916, the six apparitions of Our Lady from May to October on the 13th of each month, except in August, because the Chapter children were in jail. And uh, uh, 1925, when Our Lady appeared in Spain in a city called Pontevedra, uh, only to Sister Lucia. It was the famous apparition of First Saturday devotion. And then 1929, uh, the apparition of Tui, when Our Lady appeared to Lucia and also the Most Holy Trinity, 1929. This apparition I will speak um, deeply tomorrow, God willing, okay? So all of this is the message of Fatima. So every time I say Fatima, I'm talking about all. As you notice, it is impossible, or as you can understand, to speak about everything in one hour or even in two hours. But I'm trying to enlighten the most important aspects of this message. But Starting again, there are like two doors to come into this message, okay? One of the door is the word, or are the words that Our Lady spoke, that the angel spoke, okay? This is one door we have to come into this great message. What happened? The facts, but from the perspective of the Blessed Mother, of the angel, the events. Another door to come into the message of Fatima is the life of Francisco and Jacinta. And I can tell you that if in this moment all the books with the words of Our Lady, all the books with the words of the angel disappeared from earth, okay? No books, and only the books telling the story of the life of Francisco and Jacinta remain, just by looking to their lives, we can achieve the essential of the message of Fatima. Are, are you following me? Okay, if you don't follow, just let me know. Okay, slow down, because then I'm starting to speed, because, yeah, I have to know exactly when I have to get. Be quiet. <laughs> it will be like, uh, uh, Marie, where is my Marie? Just let me know. Okay, Marie, let me know when it's missing five minutes. But do it gently, okay, <laughs> kind. <of. laughs> yeah, she's tough. Okay, I'm getting, I think I'll take this. I'm getting hot already. Okay, so like I'm telling you, just looking to the lives of Francisco and Jacinta, just looking at them, we can achieve the most important aspects of the message of Fatima. And my friends, this is the first challenge these two little children present to us. All of you are, are Catholics, right? More or less, ba baptized, right? Imagine that right now, from the earth, all the Bibles disappear. Would it be possible that those who are not Catholics, just looking by our way of behaving, 
Could they achieve the essential message of Christi Christ just looking to the way we behave? Yeah, I can see some... Mm, I, uh, well, this is the challenge. We are called to be so faithful to the values of the gospel, to the teaching of Jesus, in such a way that just looking by the way we behave, people who do not believe can get access to the heart of Jesus. Am I, am I explaining myself? Okay, until then, that means we still have a long journey to go, which is okay, but let's face it, this is the way. And you know, one day I was talking to young people here in the United States in a college, and one of the young students told me, you know, sister, you are right, because like you know, many times we are the only Bible many people will read, right? So this is the first challenge of Francisco and Jacinta, the challenge of being so faithful to our baptismal grace that just looking at us, people can see Jesus. Am I being clear? Yeah. yeah. So let's meet up with Francisco and Jacinta. Now let's go to the real thing. God seeks. These words are not mine. These words are from Pope Benedict XVI when he was in Fatima, 2010. Uh, he celebrated May 13. <laughs> Even the popes go to Fatima on May 13. May 13, 2010, Pope Benedict was in Fatima, and in his homily, he, he said this. In sacred scriptures, we often find that God seeks righteous men and women in order to save the city of man, which is humanity. And he does the same here in Fatima, when Our Lady asked the children, are you willing to offer yourselves to God? Why do I love this sentence from Pope Benedict XVI? Because it presents from the beginning my horizon of the life of Francisco and Jacinta. Why were they living this adventure? Not for themselves but to cooperate in the work of salvation. Can you see it? God seeks righteous men and women in order to save the city of men. This expression, city of men, is from St. Augustine, definitely. So, to save the humanity. So, from the beginning, Pope Benedict teaches us the life of Francisco and Jacinta is not for their own good, but for the salvation of the world, for peace in the world. And this is... Also a great challenge for us, my friends. Our life is not for our own good only. You know, if I, if I am living just to be myself, happy, the most fulfilled people I've, I mean, what's the point about living, right? We live for others. And this is how Benedict XVI, from the beginning, understood the life of Francisco and Jacinta. Yes, they were called not for their own sake, but for the sake of others. So why they, did, why they saw Our Lady? To be happy. Yes, of course they were happy, but it's like a side effect. Am I explaining? Like in the doctor language. It's a side effect. They became very happy. They became saints. They became the most fulfilled people I've ever met. But as a consequence of this attitude of saying yes to that question, are you willing to offer yourselves to God? Yes, we are. Okay, so everything began with a question that shows how much God respected the life of these children, even if they were only children. The story didn't go on without their permission, without their answer. Because if they said, no, we don't, it's over. OK, so we can see, even if they, they deal with a lot of sufferings, we can see how from the beginning God was respecting their free will, like with us, you know? I can see here many young people, uh, many, I'm sure God will knock at our door for a special vocation, or religious life, or priesthood life, or marriage. We can say yes, but we can also say no. And then we have to accept the consequences, right? <laughs> and the consequences of this yes was a canonization. So never be afraid of saying yes to God, no matter what, okay? What you will, we will achieve is definitely happiness. So let's go briefly to their chronology, to their biography. Uh, they were born Francisco in 11 June 1908 and Jacinta March 11, 1910 in this house. So how many of you were already in Fatima? Can you raise up your hand so I can have an idea? 
Yes. So how many of you were never in Fatima? The rest. <laughs> so my dear, it's time to go, okay? I can meet you there, and I can feed you a talk there. Father Kaz and Marie know my contact. So they were born in this house that we can visit. It's just a simple house. They were baptized, as was usual in these times, eight, eight days after the birth, in the parish church that you can see with the, the garment of the, the dress, June 20, 1908, Francisco and Jacinta, March 19, so Our Lady, uh, our, the feast day of St. Joseph, 1910. Okay, both of them were sick in October 18. Okay, mm, let me see if the young people here know how to answer this question. What was happening in the world 1918? World War, world War One. Very good. So usually after a war, there is an ep epidemic, there is a disease. And this, this is what happened. We, are, we, we were getting close to the end of the First World War, 1418, and then the famous Spanish flu came. So it was a flu that killed millions of people, not only Francisco and Jacinto, okay? So they also were caught by this flu that arrived to Portugal. Thousands of people died in Portugal, so they were thick, sick. Francisco was the first one who, who, who died. So Our Lady appeared in 1917, Francisco died in 1919, April 4. So, uh, and I'm starting to tell stories about them, so in order for us also to understand their spirituality. Um, for those of you, I'm sure, well, probably not noticed, those of you who were in Fatima, as you know, the bodies of Francisco, the remains are in the Basilica, right? in the Basilica of Our Lady of the Rosary. They were moved from the cemetery where they were buried to the Basilica in the 50s. The funny thing is, Jacinta moved, or the body, in 1951 and Francisco in 1952, one year later. So what is the question? Why? Why? Exactly. Why? Okay, now I'm going to tell the question, the story why. I will answer you why. Because this is one, one of my questions, you know. When, before I was vice postulator, I was, you know, praying and I said, poor Francisco, it seems he'll, he's always late, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he had a Marian vocation. I don't know if he was <laughs> Okay, this is a joke between me and Father Cass. You don't mind, do you, Father Cass? Well, now it's too late, I already <laughs> No, Francisco, no, apparently, you know, among the, the three of them, Francisco is the less known. The people understand less, and I, I can also say that they love less, you know, which is very sad, because he's a remarkable boy. And I am telling you the story, and I have to admit, I also start to love him more after becoming vice postulator and then postulator, because I saw some documents, I was doing my research, trying to answer this question, why one year later? I mean, was not everything ready for both of the bodies? Of course it was. So, we go back to 1917, May 13, okay? Can you look at my hands? Like I say, I'm not Italian, but I speak with my hands too. Here is the new, the old basilica, Our Lady of the Rosary. Then goes a little valley, okay? Here is the spot of the apparitions, the Capulina, where now is the little chapel. Now here is the new basilica, Our Lady of the Most, um, the Most Holy Trinity. And then two miles away, their homes. Okay, do you follow me? So May 13, they come from their homes to this place and they were playing with the, the sheep. Okay? This sheep, whatever, the animals. <laughs> Uh, they were shepherds, so they were, yeah. They saw lightning, and they thought, it's coming a storm, let's go home. Okay, 12 o'clock. When they arrived to this spot, so where now is the Capelinha, where, where was the tree, very small, like this, they saw a second lightning. And in this moment, according to Francisco's mother testimony, only after the second lightning, when they saw Our Lady on the tree, only Jacinta and Lucia could see Our Lady, not Francisco. Right in the beginning, he couldn't see. So the girls knelt down in front of the tree where was Our Lady. So put yourself in Francisco's shoes. Like, come on, girls, it's coming a storm. We have to go home. And right now, you decided to pray in front of a tree. 
So, you know, he said something that Lucia could have underst understood. Francisco is not seeing Our Lady. So Lucia asked Our Lady, why cannot Francisco see you? This is so beautiful. Why? Our Lady did not answer why. You know, some of our whys, why God did this happen to me? You know, these kind of why questions that we make to God, some of it probably we will not get an answer here. But just keep going, okay? Eventually, one day, in heaven, if we trust our Lord, we will know everything. We will have all the eternity to talk about these questions. I have already my collection, you know? <laughs> it's getting on. Some already, after many years, already receive an answer. You got it? But we need patience, which is something that we don't have. Anyway, why cannot Francisco see you? Our Lady gave him the solution. Tell him to pray the rosary and he will see me. This is how I started to love Francisco, I have to admit. Because in his mind was just, think about this, it's coming a storm, we have to go home, you are praying and now I have to pray? You know, if it was me, I would start immediately, why the rosary? Why me? Why now? You know, I was starting with all my intellectual questions. He did not ask anything, he just obeyed. He, picked, he took his rosary out of his pocket, he started to pray the rosary, and at the sixth or the seventh Hail Mary, he started to see Our Lady. So the message of Fatima for Francisco started with a single act of obedience to the prayer of the rosary. Am I explaining myself? Yes. You got it. So then the dialogue started. He could never listen to Our Lady, okay? He only saw. Jacinta saw and heard. And Lucia saw, heard, and she was the one who was talking, okay? So then the dialogue starts, and Our Lady, and Lucia asks Our Lady, where are you from? I'm from heaven. Am I going to heaven? Yes, you are. And what about Jacinta? Yes, she is. And about Francisco? Yes, but? <laughs> Poor Francisco, see? I love this guy. <laughs> but he has to pray many rosaries. Okay, so Lucia told him, Francisco, you have to pray many rosaries. He says, oh, I will pray as many as Our Lady wants. And in the end of the apparitions, as you know, Our Lady said her name, and it's beautiful. She did not say, I am Our Lady of Fatima. She said, I am Our Lady of the Rosary. So what happened with Francisco? He started to be by himself many times to pray the Rosary. Many people ask me, sister, who was he, you know, not such a good guy as the other girls, of course he was good. The thing is, he had a contemplative vocation to develop. You know, he, he was the contemplative of the group. But if Our Lady told him, Francisco, you have a contemplative vocation, he would not understand, you see? So she said, you have to pray many rosaries. That he could understand. So he was praying, and while he was getting alone to pray, he developed his contemplative prayer. That's the thing. But I think Our Lady, and this is something that I'm going to show you to get into the story, that it's like the signature of Our Lady saying, yes, he prayed as many as it was necessary, or even more. Because 1951, so a couple of years later after he's dead, they were ready, the Basilica was there ready to get the remains of Jacinta and the remains of Francisco. With Jacinta there was no problem, I'll let you know afterwards why. With Francisco, you know, you have to think about in 1919, they did not know how this story was going to, to evolve. So they just buried, they were very poor, they only put a cross with nothing else in the place where he was buried. So in 1951, they asked for the father to do the recognition of the place. So the father came, said, my Francisco is buried here. They opened the casket and they saw bones. Okay, it's Francisco you know, a small casket, but then the doctors came and made the examination and they realized those bones could not belong to Francisco because they were a part of a child of two or three years old. That's why, you know, it was like this discomfort thing, right? And now, okay, this is not Francisco. That's why they moved Jacinta and they wait for one year. 
What happened was the father was insisting, here is my Francisco. What happened is because of the flu, the epi epidemic, many children died. And another one in the family, so they forgot he was buried on the top of Francisco, you know, just forgot. There was that boy or, or girl buried. And uh, okay, they, you know, they wait. So father was insisting he's buried here. So they dig deeper. They open the casket. As soon as they, they found another one bigger, they open. And the father said, only bones. And father said immediately, is my Francisco. They were like, how do you know? Because intact was his rosary, which I'll show you the picture. Here, my picture, where you can see the priests. All the beads were there, except two that were broken. All the beads. And remember, he was very poor. He only had one rosary, which was the family rosary, the one that he was holding. All the beads were there. There are two other signals that I'm not going to describe, including the, the doctors that said that belonged to a, a, a child from 10 to 12 years old, so it could be Francisco. There are two other things that helped the recognition, but the first sign that gave his identity is his rosary. I don't think this is a coincidence, my friends. I really think this is Our Lady saying he did. And maybe, who knows, the rosary is important for our Catholic identity. The prayer, of course. Okay? Do we got it? So Francisco was moved from the cemetery of Fatima to the Basilica of Fatima on March 13, 1952. Amazing that March 13, 2013, one pope named Francis, Francisco, became a pope, which I think it's beautiful. Jacinta one day was very, very excited after the apparitions. Lucia came and asked Jacinta, what, what's going on? And she says, well, Our Lady came and visited us again. She told us that very soon she would take Francisco to heaven. And now listen to the dialogue. To me, she asked me if I want to remain here a little bit more to offer even more for the conversion of sinners. I said yes. So Our Lady told me I was going to two hospitals and I would die alone. And it was amazing to share this with the doctors and nurses this weekend, right? The loneliness of Jacinta in the moment of her death was the greatest suffering she had. Because back in 1920, when she died, nobody died alone. Okay, everybody died in their homes with the families. What happened so? She went to, to this hospital in Orem from July and August, two months, 1919. This was the doctor who treated her. She got with, um, okay, she had uh, the Spanish flu, became a pneumonia, then became an abscess, infected, and came to the outside. So I'm, I'm skipping some details because of the children we have here, okay? I don't want to, anyway. But she had a, um, a wound in her uh, left chest, the left part of her chest, and why they changed her to Lisbon? You have to know that Lisbon is the capital of my country. Today, it's one hour and 15 driving. Those days was a whole day in the train. Okay? We are 1920, no electricity, no phones, nothing. So why did they move Jacinta to the hospital of Lisbon? Because they want to save her. They want to cure her. They could not believe a nine-year-old child that was saying, I'm going to Lisbon, but I'm going to die. You know, and they did not want her to die because she was the favorite, you know. She was like the star of the group. She, she was full of joy, of happiness, of enthusiasm. And Francisco was already dead. They could not accept the idea that Jacinta was going to die, okay? Do you follow me? So that's why they moved her to Lisbon, because they, they brought her to the best hospital for children in the country. Uh, well, the only one in those days. Okay, that's why she went to Lisbon. Of course, the first, day, the first day she had no place to stay in the hospital, so she stayed in this orphanage that you can visit. It's, now it's a monastery of poor clerises in Lisbon. There is a place that you can visit, some people go there, where she stayed from the 21st of January 1920 until 2nd of February 1920, so she stayed there for a couple of days. Then she had a place in the hospital of uh, Dona Stefania, this is, okay, the upper part is the, the infirmary. Okay, she stayed in bed number 38. 
And in that picture is the surgery room because she had a surgery. Uh, I'm not describing the surgery, okay? So she had a pneumonia with all these diagnoses. The treatment was uh, very painful. Okay, this is the slides for the nurses and doctors yesterday, so I'm, I'm skipping, okay? It's a little bit... Uh, this is the doctor who performed the surgery to Jacinta to, you know, to take the... without uh, general anesthesia, okay? Yeah. And he said, he quotes his heroic patients, how much she suffered, the way she suffered. The only words sh she said during the surgery was, oh Jesus, oh my Lord. Anyway, many testimonies how she was never complaining, very, you know, always, even smiling. We have testimonies who say, for example, Lucia, when visit Jacinta in the hospital of Orem, said, I always found her happy to have the opportunity to offer herself to God for us. These are the two nurses that treated her. This is, the, this is a beautiful thing. Okay, you, can, you have to think of a body of someone with a wound that does not smell very good, okay? But after she died, there are several testimonies that confirm that her body started to smell like flowers. And this is the chief of the pediatric union of that hospital, who is an atheistic, or was an atheistic. And this, he said this, we have this written, either from the science that I know or from the spirituality that I don't know, so it's really not Catholic, I cannot find explanation to the fact that at the time of death, Jacinta's body smelled like flowers. So really, it was one of the miracles of Jacinta. This is a gentleman, okay. February 20th, 1920, she died with the age of nine years old, almost becoming 10, okay? First, she was moved to this tomb. I'm going quickly because the spiritual part, that's what I really want to share with you. Just, but this, at least you have some ideas what happened in their lives. 19, 1920, uh, there were, or 19, yeah, when she died, a lot of persecution was to Fatima, okay? From the beginning, Fatima was not easy uh, to develop. So the body arrived from a train Okay, and she, she came alone, nobody of the family was there to pick up the body. From Lisbon, arrived to Orem. Orem is a city nine miles away from Fatima, so the closest city. And because they were afraid of people to, you know, don't treat respectfully the body, a family very rich offered their tomb so Jacinta could stay there, okay? That's why we have no doubt on the 15th, where is the body of Jacinta? Because the body of Jacinta stood here until 12 of this September, 1935. Okay, and now I will show you the next picture. I will show you really quickly, because again, there are children. And um, the next picture explains us why Jacinta is the great apostle of Fatima. Okay, let's go back again to May 13. In the end of the apparition, Jacinta was so enthusiastic. What a beautiful lady. And Lucia, being 10 years old, asked Jacinta, come on, Jacinta, we are not going to say this to anyone. No, 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 don't worry, I'm not telling anything. Oh, but what a beautiful lady. So from the place of the apparition to their homes, she was hopping, you know, <laughs> between what a beautiful lady. I promise, I promise, I'm not saying a word. Don't worry, Lucia, don't worry. Oh, but she is so beautiful. Can you imagine one mile and a half in this? As soon as she saw her mom, seven years old, what was the first thing she said? Yeah, mom, we saw this beautiful lady in the cova. It's our lady. So the word was spread. Jacinta was the first apostle of Fatima. Okay, we will go back here. I love her. She is my pa patron saint in this work that I do to speak about Fatima, it's Jacinta. But also after death, she was a great apostle of Fatima because in 1935, I am going quickly through that slide, they open, okay, 1935, the parents ask the body to go to the cemetery of Fatima, okay? And when they open the casket, we can see the body is incorrupt. I'll show you a little picture, okay, quickly. And the funny is, you can see the coffin, you will see it with a, with a something cover. And they took the picture and they send this picture to Lucia. 
and Sister Lucia was already a nun, receiving the picture that she saw the face of Jacinta, write a letter to the bishop saying, thank you, Your Excellency, for the picture you sent me, because I could see the face of my best friend from my childhood. I almost forgot I was in front of a picture and I want to open that, you know, that, you know, in order I could hug her. So many are the memories I have from Jacinta. So the bishops thought, yeah, we did not ask Lucia how was Jacinta. So they said in a letter, please, Lucia, write everything you recall from Jacinta. So Lucia wrote one letter about Jacinta. When the bishop read the letter, said, this is amazing. So he asked her another, reading, another letter, you spoke about an angel, tell us the angel. A second letter came. When the bishop read, said, said well, well, now you write again about, you know, third letter. Eventually, in the, the end, like 10 years later, he said, now, Lucia, now you write about everything again. Tell again the, all the apparitions. Tell now about Francisco. See, Francisco only arrives in the letter of the forties. <laughs> Poor Francisco. And he is such a great guy, anyway. You see? So that, those four letters are this book. Fatima and Lucia's own, well, mine has an old cover, but Fatima and Lucia's own words, which is the book who spread the greatest the message of Fatima in the world. And this book is about Jacinta, because of Jacinta's picture. Can you see? So this is where you see her little body corrupt. So 1935, to go, she goes to the cemetery of Fatima. 1951, she goes to the basilica. So there were no doubts where the body of Jacinta was, okay? This is the day where May 1st, they were, she was transferred to the, um, to the Basilica of Fatima. This is the great day of her beatification, May 13, 2000. They were beatified. This is the little boy who was the boy responsible for the miracle that led us to canonization. His name is Lucas. Then in the end, if you want, I can share some things. And this is the great day where Pope Francis canonized Francisco and Jacinta exactly one year ago. And they became the youngest, youngest saints, non-martyrs in the history of the church. There is no one younger than Jacinta and no one younger than Francisco, of course, you know? So, but let's now go and look at them interiorly. How were the little shepherds before the apparition? And you know the good news? They were not saints. <laughs> this is great. Are you tired? No. Because now it's going to be dance. Uh, tense, not dance. I'm not going to dance. <laughs> Just talk, okay? Let's keep going. <laughs> are you still with me? Yeah. You are? I'm talking to that little guy. Ryan, he knows. He knows what I'm talking. He, he saw me. Okay. The, one of the, my favorite pages of this book is when Lucia describes Francisco and Jacinta before the apparitions. And the beautiful thing is they were normal, with defaults. Look how she describes Francisco before the apparitions. I did not always feel too kindly disposed towards him. So she didn't like him, basically, right? Because his natural calm temperament exasperated my excessive vivacity. Well, I will translate to you this, okay? So, Lucy, Lucia was very, you know, like this. More or less like me. And Francisco was more, who cares? You know this kind of thing? So when somebody was teasing with Francisco, he just wouldn't care. And Lucia, when she got furious and she said, come on, Francisco, go to that corner. And he would go. And that make her even more nervous. <laughs> now, now come back, and you'd come. You see, no worries. So that really, uh, according to Lucia, could be a default. And it is. You know, the world could be falling apart. That he, who cares? <laughs> this is an obstacle to sanctity, my friends. Okay, because saints are not the kind of who cares. Mm -hmm. Saints do care. So Francisco was a little bit indifferent to. I mean, who cares? So. And then, and then she said, Lucia, but in my opinion, is that if he had lived to manhood, his greatest effect would have been this attitude of, never mind. <laughs> okay, Jacinta is even better. Look what Lucia says. 
I sometimes found Jacinta's company quite disagreeable <laughs> on account of her oversensitive temperament. So Jacinta was amazing. Everything has to be according to her will. Are you familiar with this? Special of you with children. <laughs> Everything has to be according to her will. When it was not according to her will, do you know how she do like that? And she would go to a corner pow powering? Powering. She was like that, that kind of girl. And then Jacinta Lucia describes to make her come back playing again was not enough the most sweetest caresses to make her come back. It was necessary to let her choose the game, the companion, you know, the friend whom she'd play with, and if there, you know, at least in Portugal, when children play and when somebody loses, they have like little punishment, you know, they have to do something, you know? When she loses, she has to choose her own, you know, her own punishment. So everything has to be like she, otherwise there will be a problem. She would not come back. Okay, look at this. Everything has to be according to her will. When it was not, she was not happy. And then everything has to be according to her will to make her smile again. We are not like that, are we? <laughs> Okay, so my question is, who was the center of the life of Jacinta? Jacinta. So they had, they experienced a process of conversion. Of course they did. And what was their conversion? Is to accept, to change the center of their lives that they are no longer the center of their lives, but those they met are the center of their lives, become the center of their lives. And this, my friends, this is conversion in the end, is to accept that I am not the protagonist of my own story. And even for us spiritual people, this is the great challenge. Because if Our Lady became, you know, like she did, it's because if you go to the Gospel, she is never the protagonist of her story. The protagonist of her story is Jesus, right? That's why she is the Blessed Mother. Okay, so what is the conversion of Francisco and Jacinta? They accepted that the center of their lives start to be Jesus, Mary, and all the humanity in their sufferings, no matter what it was, poor people, sick people, or the poor souls that they saw going to hell. Am I explaining myself? So, what they start to do afterwards? Start to love. Not loving themselves as they were the center of the world, but love those they found in suffering. So, the invitation is, are you willing to offer yourselves to God? And they said, yes, we are. You know, it's beautiful, and tomorrow we will see it a little bit when I will speak about the mercy in the message of Fatima. Of course, they were prepared by the angel, 1916, okay? In the first apparition, the angel asks for prayers. Pray, my God, I believe, I adore, okay? Remember these prayers? Pray. In the second apparition, the, of, the angel says, pray and make sacrifices. When one comes Our Lady, are you willing to offer yourselves? Not only prayers, not only sacrifices. I don't know if I'm explaining myself, because still prayer is something that I do. 20 minutes, that's it. One hour for mass, that's it. But it's nothing. I can be praying without offer myself to God. I don't know if I am, okay? So, but we can see in the message of Fatima how, we, how it goes. We start, okay, with prayers that help us, then little sacrifices, and we will speak a little bit about sacrifices in the end of the talk. But above all, what does God want from us? Everything. <laughs> you got it? everything he wants for our life so we can fulfill our life with his own life and this is the only way he can do it if we offer it okay yes we are willing and they took a, a, a big conversion so how can we describe Jacinta and I will present you now some characteristics of the life of Jacinta and Francisco so we can understand how they achieve sanctity with the grace of the Holy Spirit. One day, Jacinta, and this is an icon from Rupnik, which is a famous okay, painter. 
and, and there's mosaics. Um, one day Jacinta was with one lamb in the middle of the flock. And they ask, Lucia asked, Jacinta, what are you doing with one lamb in your arms in the middle of the, the, the sheep, right? And Jacinta said, I am doing like our Lord. In that holy card that I saw, our Lord is like that, with one lamb in his arm and in the middle of the sheep. Of course, she was talking about the Good Shepherd, that she had an holy card. It was one of her favorite. They were little shepherds, so I think they felt connected. I am doing like our Lord. And this became like the motto of Jacinta's life. If you ask me, sister, you know, sometimes, especially the journalists do these kind of questions, right? Can you say in two sentences the life of Jacinta, right? I always say she did like our Lord. What was her life trying to do like our Lord? So if I have to pick up a quote from the gospel trying to describe Jacinta, I would pick up this from the book of John. The, like Jesus said in the Last Supper, indeed I have set you an example, so that just I have done, you also should do. So this is Jacinta, a little girl who tried to spend all her life doing like Jesus. What about Francisco? Okay, Francisco, he was so many times alone. Lucia sometimes would call him, Francisco, where are you? And finally you'd come out of, you know, behind a rock or a bush. What were you doing? And you'd answer, I was thinking about our Lord. It is so beautiful. So can you see Francisco was the one that always thinks about our Lord. That means prayer, adoration, contemplation. And Jacinta is the one that does like our Lord. Isn't this the mission of each one of us? To think about our Lord, pray, and do like he did. Action. In these, these little two lives, we are like the summary of our spiritual life. So, but he was so much centered in God, and we will pick up now the little bit of some aspects, so I'll tell you some stories so we can understand more their lives. If I could um, summarize the life of Francisco according to one of the sentences of the Gospel of the Letters of Paul, I would find the letter of St. Paul to the Philippians. Philippians. You know that I always say Philippians? <laughs> <laughs> and I said again. I know also the Philippines read the letter of Philippians, <laughs> but it's not too bad, only. It's also to the American people, okay? Uh, Francisco is very much like this. I consider all these things like a loss, that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Believe me, Francisco was all about Christ. So I will now describe in you one of the characteristics of Francisco was the centrality of God in his life. One day they asked him, Francisco, what did you like to see the most? And it was clear. Think about the nine-year-old boy. Know all the hierarchy of the truth of our Catholic faith in his mind. He said, I like to see the angel, but I love even more to see Our Lady. But what I really love to see was Our Lord in that light that Our Lady put us in our heart. I love God so much. So who is Francisco? God. Only one. <laughs> I have a little one echoing, no? Francisco. <laughs> it's a... <laughs> It is amazing because the angel, after giving them communion, said these words, console your God. Francisco, as, as you see, he couldn't listen, but he was seeing inside and he understood that God was sad because of the sins, of course. So his mission was to console God. He was always trying to console God. I love God so much, but he is so sad. I wish I could bring him joy. So you'd spend hours of adoration, praying everything just with this, console God. So one day when he was going to die, and you know, when a saint person dies, we always go next to ask for our intentions, right? Like I did to my grandmother. When my grandmother is dying, and I could see and she was a holy woman, I was saying, Grandma, please, when you arrive to heaven, ask for me, for this, for that, right? So Lucia was doing the same for Francisco. Please, Francisco, when you arrive to heaven, ask for this and for that and for that and for that. And he said, well, Lucia, these things is, is better if you ask them to Jacinta. Because I am afraid when I arrive to heaven, I'll forget them. <laughs> but he had, he had. 
It says, because when I see Jesus, I only want to console him. So really, the center of Francisco was God. Everything in Francisco was about God. So it teaches us this thing. Is God the center of my life? You know, my friends, sometimes in our 21st century, with so many responsibilities, the children, the house, the job, the career, sometimes with so many temptations like money, power, uh, and so on, okay? One of our greatest mistakes that bring us a lot of suffering is that we confuse and mix uh, what is essential than what is secondary. Am I explaining? What Francisco is teaching me is to treat the essential things as essential. And the secondary things that are important as secondary. The problem is we spend much more time and energy in secondary things than in the essential things. Am I not right? Well, maybe you are not because you are saints. I am. <laughs> you know, what is the essential thing of our life? I'm sorry, my friends, my relationship with God and my family. And then comes the friends, and then comes everything rest. How much time do you spend with God and with your families? That can be a religious community, that can be, of course, my parish, or the time we spend with the other things. That's why we have so many breakdowns and burnouts and sufferings and confusion and breaking commitments. Because we just spend much more time and energy with secondary things than with essential. And we confuse them. And we get to a point we don't know anymore. Who are we? What am I doing? Right? This is the first great lesson of Francisco. Do like an exam of conscience in this way. Uh, what is essential in my life and how much time do I spend with it? If we got to organize that, believe me, I think 90% of our problems would go away. I am fully convinced of this, okay? Centrality of God in our life. His school was really the tabernacle, yes. As you know, in June, Our Lady told them, I want you to pray the rosary every day and I want you to learn how to read. Of course, they understood this is for Lucia's mainly because they were going to die and Our Lady just told them. So Francisco was going to school, but very soon he got sick. He got sick right in the beginning of the school headache, and the, the parish church was very close to the school, like it is here. So instead of going to school because he was dying, he was going to, to church. And sometimes he would spend all the time of the lessons in the church in front of the tabernacle. I'm talking about three hours. In the same position, it was amazing, his hours. His teacher was Our Lady. Okay, many people think that, yes, uh, Jacinta has a special love toward the, towards Our Lady, and yes, she had. Okay, I'm not, uh, I'm going to Jacinta in a minute. But Francisco also had a very special love to Our Lady. And, and, and um, I'm running late, Father. No, I'm not running late, okay? Are you still with me? Um, got it. Okay, my friend here is my, my, my. Yes, exactly. Thank you. I was looking for the word. August 13, okay, July 13, 1917, was the famous apparition of the secret. Our Lady told them a secret, okay? As you know, when there is a secret, even if we know everything, that's the only thing we look for, right? So everybody was willing to know the secret, including the mayor, man of Orem, that city where Jacinta was in the hospital, he wanted to know the secret. So August 13, went to their homes and lied to the families and told them, I take them to the spot of the apparition, but instead of taking them, he took them to jail, as you know. So the three shepherd children were in jail from 13 of August to 15 of August, just because he wants to know the secret. I want you to know he did not uh, physically did no harm to them, okay? It's just psychologically. They could not see the family, they couldn't go home, and they were interrogated over and over again. And they were threatened even with death, which they accepted. I mean, they were not telling the secret. But while they were going in the horse carriage to the spot 
Okay, away from the spot of the apparition, Francisco was understanding. He is not taking us to the place of the apparition. So Jacinta starts to cry because she's afraid, okay? She's seven years old. Francisco, he never cries. Do you know what was his only concerning? It's, it's coming 12 o'clock and we will not be there. So as soon as time goes, Jacinta cries because they understand they are in jail, under arrested, you know? And the only problem of Francisco was, our lady is going to come. She will be there and we won't be there and she will be sad. So after 12 o'clock, the saddest thing about Francisco was, we were not there. So the next day, uh, Jacinta was, keep crying and Francisco answers this. This is remarkable. Jacinta, why are you crying? And Jacinta said, because at least I want to see our mom once more. You know, they, they were thinking they were going to die. And Francisco, you know what he answered? And for a nine-year-old boy, a mother is still everything. Then it's not anymore, right? But at the age of nine, and he said, if we don't see our mother again, let's offer this to God. The worst is if Our Lady is not coming again. That's what makes me more sad. You see, for, for this little nine-year-old boy, the thing was, if Our Lady is not coming again. This is amazing. You know, a boy who says this is a saint. The problem is, if Our Lady is not coming again. I wish, I, how could, I wish we could have these things so well, you know? So, that's why on, on August 19, when Our Lady appeared, Lucia said he was, she came, you know, she, he was so happy. So Our Lady was his love. Of course his treasure was the rosary. Like I told you, okay? So why the rosary is important, and, and here I'm telling two stories, okay? May I tell the stories, Father? The one I told yesterday, I told. Okay, I have to tell these two stories and then, then I'm, I'm, I'm jumping to, to Jacinta and then I'll finish, okay? Are you with me? Okay, why the rosary is so important? <laughs> well, first of all, because Our Lady asked, and like Francisco told us, obedience make us see. Not with our physical eyes, okay, of course. Make us see interiorly the will of God. But there are two other reasons why the rosary is important for peace in the world, exactly. But two reasons that I learned in my spiritual life. Now I'll tell you a story while I was a novice, okay? Okay, I am a sister... I will be 23 years in July. So, I was a novice. Do you know a novice is the sisters in the first years? So this was like 20 years ago. Okay, it was so hard for me to leave my family, you know, to leave my medical career. I have to tell you, I, I struggled a little bit. That I decided, okay, Lord, now that I'm going to leave everything because of you, it will be worthwhile. I want to become a saint. And I make the decision, okay, very solemnly, I will be a saint. <laughs> Do you follow me? So then I was thinking, always in my mind, you know, what is necessary to become a saint? Then I, I, I find like a little, you know, okay, to become a saint, I need to be a good sister. So, right? So in order to be a good sister, I need to be first a good Catholic. Being a good Catholic, I'll become a good sister and eventually a saint. So everything was clear. I said, easy. I just need to be a good Catholic. So here I am again. What is to be a good Catholic? So I'm going to the gospel, and I found that young man who meets Jesus, remember? And they ask him, Lord, what is necessary to go to heaven, right? And what did our Lord say? Keep the commandments. This is the beginning of the dialogue. I said, well, keep the commandments. Apparently was not enough. Because the boy says, I do it. So sell everything you said and follow me, right? I said, so, it's not only keep the commandments. Are you following me? Good, a good Catholic, it's not only to keep the commandments. So I thought, okay, it's follow Christ. If I follow Christ, I'll be a good Christian, right? But even St. Peter in the Gospel is following Christ in the night of the agony. But the Gospel says he's following from, a par from far away, right? That's why he denied him, because he was following Christ, but you know, far away. So I understand. Well, it's not only that. Then I went to St. Paul's letters, and St. Paul told me, 
that to be a good Christian, good Catholic, is not only to keep the commandments, not only to follow Christ. Do you know what he says in the letter to the Galatians? To become like Christ. Do you agree with me? I said, easy. <laughs> I become like Christ. And then again, this letter to the Philippians, is, he says, have in yourselves the same feelings that Jesus had. Do you remember this sentence? So I said, easy, I have in myself the same feelings that Jesus had. I become like Christ and I'll be saved. Okay, Marie, you know I'm not saying a lie. My convent, where I am, it's a, the most tiny little convent you ever saw, okay? All this room is longer than my whole convent. In those days, we were 14 sisters living in a tiny little convent. Took me literally eight to 10 steps to go from the chapel to the kitchen, okay? So this happened in one morning prayer after I decide I will become like Christ. I will always have the same feelings of Jesus, okay? I was praying morning prayers before breakfast, 14 young, starving women. Here I am saying, Jesus, today I'll be like you. I will always be kind. I will always be patient. I will always smile to my children, uh, to my sisters, not my children. I, I'm a nun, I don't have children, okay? <laughs> sisters. I will, you know, you know these kind of things? Morning prayer. I, I will forgive everything. Finishes the morning prayer and I'm hungry, right? All of us go to the breakfast and there is a line for the microwave to warm up our cup, you know, our cup of coffee. So there was only one microwave and the line was big. Okay, but I was there in the middle of the line waiting for my turn with my cup of coffee. Can you think about this? <laughs> Putting my coffee, my cup in the microwave when a sister that was behind me skipped the line and she puts the cup before mine in the microwave. So do you know where the feelings like Christ go? <laughs> I think to the microwave. <laughs> I start to you know, almost to yell, what are you doing? I mean, come on, go to the line, just wait your turn. What are you, so rude? I mean, it's my time. <laughs> Poor sister, she was like, oh, so she thought it was like the Third World War <laughs> starting <laughs> in the kitchen just because. Now, I was so everything against what I just prayed. No, but everything. And it was so, you know, so over much that even myself, I noticed, I mean, it was just one minute ago. One minute ago. Did this, this ever happen to you? <laughs> it's horrible, isn't it? We, we take a decision and, and the next thing it happens. I think Jesus do it in purpose, Father. <laughs> That's what I'm realizing. You know, I realize I'm not going to make it. <laughs> really, and you know something? This became a temptation. Because I said, if I cannot make it in the breakfast with the sisters that I love, imagine the rest. I said, I will not become like Christ. I will not be a good sister. That's over. I'm going home. And I had my first spiritual vocational crisis. Then I had so many crises afterwards that I'm an expert now <laughs> in vocational crisis. But this was the first one, OK? Just the first one. So I was struggling. And I even said to my mistress of novices and to my spiritual director, I cannot do it. I will not be a lukewarm sister. And if I cannot be like Christ, I'm going home. That's it. So I was struggling and struggling, and now they give me all these great, beautiful cards. And I was struggling. I said, OK, OK. Until 2002, took me a while, when the great saint, John Paul II, solved this Christ. He wrote a letter on the rosary, on the most holy rosary. And in number 15, and I'm quoting more or less the same words, OK? It says, the rosary mystically transports us to Mary's side. And this enables her to train us and mold us until Christ is fully formed in us. And he is quoting the letter to the Galatians. I will say it again. When we pray the rosary, we go close to Our Lady mystically. And what happens in my rosary that I am praying, she, with the Holy Spirit, 
touch my heart and my soul, mold us and form us, and this is the beautiful thing, until Christ is fully formed in us. It's beautiful that the Pope did not say until she is fully formed in us. That's not the point. The point is until Christ is fully formed in us. And I remember thinking, dear Lord, the rosary, I can do it. If you take care of the rest, I'm in peace. And th that's it, you know, the rosary, we can do it. And slowly, after 20 years, I think I am a little bit, a little bit more closer to Christ, even though, of course, there is a long way. Okay? Why the rosary is so important for our configuration with Christ. May I tell the other story, Father? Then I'll go quickly on Jacinta, then they make questions, okay? <laughs> it's okay? It's well, <laughs> just one more story, and then I'm almost finished. It's okay? Okay. <laughs> He said, okay, the little guy there, so. <laughs> For him, it's your fault now. <laughs> there is another reason why the rosary is so important, my friends, and I experienced it almost every day in Fatima, but I did not notice until 2013, when I went to Rome. Okay, as you know, Rome is in Italy, so three hours flight, and I, I, they told me I had to go there in order to become a postulator. I had to do a three months formation in Rome, okay? So it was my first time out of my home, out of my convent. I was not happy with the idea. 2013 was a couple of years ago. See how far away? So it was January, February, March 2013. So I spent all my month of January complaining, you know? Of course, I was in the Portuguese college with some sisters, but they were not my sisters, you know? I'm trying to say, no, it's not my family. So I was complaining, why, God, I'm here? Why can I not stay at home? Why, you know, why? I'm complaining all the month. Until February 11th, 2013, you know what happened? Benedict XVI resigned, and I was in Rome. <laughs> so I start to say, thank you, our Lord, thank you, because I was in Rome, living the most incredible moment, even if it was suffering in the beginning, of the church. I realize this never happened before. So February, I was in Rome in Sede Vacante, so with no Pope, and with for the Conclave, I saw everything. The only three months away from my house, and I saw everything. I was, yeah, so anyway, February 28th, it's the day where it started officially the finishing of the Benedict XVI, the coming of the Sede Vacante. You follow this? And the time was, I think it was 7 p.m. or 8 p.m. My, my, the, the Portuguese college where I was just in the back of the St. Peter's Square. So I decided to go. I had, like I say, a brilliant idea. I said, 7 o'clock, I want to be in the piazza. You know, I want to be there to see the light goes off, you know? And um, I thought, I'm sure I'm going to be the only one <laughs> praying there for the Pope. So here I am by myself, I get to the piazza, and of course, thousands of people had the same brilliant idea. <laughs> and I was not alone. So it was amazing, you know? All of us were like a little bit, you know, what is this, what's going on? There was this pain, this sorrow inside our hearts. I saw a group of uh, students, I could see the, they were priests, in one of the corner of the piazza. And I have to tell you, I could recognize they were from the North American College. For one reason, all the priests in the North American College dressed like this, okay? Black suit, clergyman, tiny shoes, and backpack. <laughs> you find this, right? It's so cute. <laughs> this is an American priest in North America. All the others dressed differently, but I thought, well, they are from the United States. I understand English, so I joined them to pray with the church. You know, we, were, we were praying for the Pope, no matter what. So I got there, there was, but there was a big group doing Alexio Divina, so a reading on the gospel. You are Peter, and upon this rock I'll establish. So beautiful, but the thing, it was open air. I couldn't, I couldn't hear everything. Some words, I don't understand them, and I don't understand everything you say, you know, some words. So somehow, even if I could understand English, I did not felt involved in the prayer, okay? So in the, in the other corner of the piazza, there was another group, smaller. I joined them French. <laughs> Worse, I don't speak French. 
<laughs> but waiting for a couple of minutes, I heard this. Je vous salue, Marie, plein de grâce, etc. I finish here, okay? <laughs> what they were praying, the rosary. I could see they had the rosary. So I thought to myself, well, I know how to pray the rosary. So I stood them there, and what happened was this group was becoming bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. The first part of the Hail Mary in French, the second part French, Portuguese, Spanish, English, Polish, German, you know. So think about this. Thousands of people praying the rosary in St. Peter's Square. We knew exactly what we were pr praying about. We were praying for the Pope. And we could understand us even if we were speaking different languages. Does don't you remind you the Pentecost? Yes. When the church around Mary asks for the Holy Spirit for the church, even if it was in different languages, we were knowing exactly what we were praying and why we were praying. So I think the rosary is important for the building of the church. In some circumstances, of course, the mass, the liturgy, okay, there. But in some circumstances, there is no other prayer that makes the church like the prayer of the rosary. And this is also a lesson that the chapter children do to us. About Jacinta, and I am two minutes for Jacinta. Okay. One day she was in, in jail and she was praying, uh, uh, crying. And Francisco and Lucia tried to help her and told her, come on Jacinta, which intention for which intention do you want to offer this suffering? Okay, I think the Saint Jacinta is born in jail, was born in jail. Because that's really the last step for her to stop thinking about herself, okay? And you can tell me, come on, sister, this is a jail. She's seven years old, I know, but we want a, we want a saint, okay? And the canonized saint. Yes, to be high level. I don't know if I'm explaining myself. So she was needing help, and the two best friends help her. See how many, how important is our good counsel to those who live with us, you know? Good advices, encouragement. Jacinta, if it was not for Francisco and Lucia in this moment, probably she could not give the last step. We need the help of the community. You know, we need the, the help of one another. We, are, we cannot do this by ourselves, okay? This is what we see in Jacinta's uh, fact that I'm going to tell you. So he is, she, here she is crying, and she, was, she, she cried for many, many hours. So she was really struggling with missing mom, with I'm afraid. So Lucia, encouraging her, said, come on, Jacinta, which intention do you choose to offer this sacrifice? To console Jesus, to console Our Lady, for the conversion of sinners, for the Holy Father, for the peace in the world, which intention do you choose? And she said, I choose them all, because I love them all. So the life of Jacinta was a total act of offering her life, her sufferings, her prayers, with compassion for the others that were suffering. No matter it was Jesus or Mary in the sorrow for our sins, no matter it's the poor sinners, peace in the world, and the Holy Father. So she never more lived for herself, but she lived her life totally for others. Yeah, and I can tell you this, uh, she not, not only offered the sacrifices they could choose, you know, they gave up food to give to the poor people, they gave up candies, they gave up these things for others, but especially she lived as a gift to God, the suffering that the life was bringing. And it was, in one hand, the disease, okay, the sufferings, the body, physical bodies. The dead of Francisco, you know, Francisco, Jacinta lived the loss of Francisco. Francisco died, her brother, and she suffered and lived this situation, not complaining, not saying, why God, but offering to God. And plus, those sufferings that her vocation brought her. And her vocation was to be a visionary, a seer. So the interrogations of priests, people, those who believe, those who do not believe, the, 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 the moments in jail. So what, how was Jacinta dealing with all her sufferings that it was her passion, right? Her passion. 
the questionings, the interrogations, misunderstandings, the disease. How did she live? She tried to live it with the same feelings like Jesus lived his own passion. Am I explaining myself? How did she live her sorrows, no matter what to be in prison, to be interrogated over and over again, to be criticized, to have the wound, to have the physical pain, to lose Francisco? How did Jacinta live her own passion with the same feelings like Jesus lived his own passion as an act of obedience towards the Father and as an act of love towards us so we can have life? Okay? This was what makes Jacinta such a special saint. And she wants so much to do like Jesus, that her dad was so much like Jesus. Think about this. She died alone, like Jesus. She died with a wound in her chest, like Jesus. After she was operated, uh, surgery, three days, she had what? Thirst. She was saying, I thirst. And they could not give her thirst, as you know, we cannot drink after a surgery so much as we want. She was thirst. And even the first tomb was not hers, was borrowed. She really lived her death. That's why I put in the last line her configuration with the Pascal mystery of Jesus. So, just to, just to remind you something, yes, they became saints. Not because, these were the words of Pope Francis. Just look to those who are in, in bold. They became saints not because they saw Our Lady, but because they were faithful to a gift. Their holiness is not the consequence of the apparitions, but their faithfulness and the ardor with which they responded to the privilege of being visited. So they are not saints because they had the apparitions. They are saints because they were faithful to their vocation, exactly with us, okay? If we do not have apparitions, that's okay. We still need to be saints by the faithfulness of our privilege of being baptized. Thank you for your patience. Thank you.